Okay, um, perfect. So the previous paper was about the um, uh, climate uh, cross-country uh, climate policy coordination. And now the next paper is about supervisory cooperation, uh, incomplete coverage in supervisory cooperation and cooperation externalities by uh, Wolf Wagner from the Rotterdam School of uh, Management. Wolf, please. Yep, thank you. So thank you for, for staying for the last uh, paper of, um, of today. Um, so the paper is on incomplete supervisory uh, cooperation. It's together with um, with Torsten, who has conveniently uh, disappeared uh, at the moment, and um, uh, Consuelo Silva Bostong from uh, Universita Católica in, in in Chile. So the paper, um, as Andrea said, actually is quite closely linked on, on a conceptual level to the to the one from uh, from Emanuela. So it's it's about cross-border regulatory uh, arbitrage. But here the source is different. So we're looking at um, cooperation of, of banking supervisors. And this cooperation is effective in the sense of the countries involved in, in the cooperation, so their risks go down. But precisely because of this, actually there's pressure to, uh, for the risk to go to, to unaffected, or to, to third countries that are not in the, in the cooperation agreement. And this has some kind of undesirable consequences for the global, um, global effectiveness of, um, of, of cooperation. So if we think about the, the big banks uh, in the world, right? So these are, these are cross-border banks that, that operate among different, uh, different countries, uh, different jurisdictions. Uh, there are a lot of different regulators and, and policy makers involved, and this creates a lot of issues, okay? So, so we know this. And uh, to, to contain uh, risks at, at, these, um, at these banks, domestic supervisors, national supervisors, they, they frequently uh, uh, cooperate. Okay. And this cooperation can take many um, different forms. So it can, for example, be some kind of joint supervision. So think about the, the banking union would be an extreme example where you, you replace national supervisors with, a, with one uh, a common supervisor, in this case for the, for the large banks. But there can be also many other um, types of agreements. And actually in our data, the most common is uh, information agreements or information a cooperation. So you're, 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 you're making an agreement to exchange information on, um, on, on your banks. So for example, this is very um, prevalent in, in Latin America. So there are a lot of small uh, agreements bilateral between the, uh, different countries and they, they're, they're agreeing on, on exchanging um, uh, information. So in a sense, the, the banking union, based in our data set, is not the most representative. Okay? It's, it's a very powerful cooperation, but um, in, in most cases, actually, we're talking about these information exchanges across um, a, a smaller set of, um, of countries. So what's the potential uh, issue with that? Uh, the issue is that these, these agreements are often made on the country level, and, and so they don't uh, necessarily uh, cover the, the involved banks. So there's a mismatch between the cooperation area and the, you know, the, 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 the geographic footprint of, of the bank. So there's this, this incomplete uh, coverage, and this creates um, regulatory arbitrage, the, regu the, the potential for regulatory arbitrage. So cooperation between A and B presumably makes it more difficult uh, for banks to take a risk in these, these countries. So they have an incentive to, to shift um, to, um, uh, to C. And this may explain why cooperation is not effective for the very largest banks. So in our, our prior uh, paper in, in, the, in the JFQA, we find that actually, if you look at consolidated, the consolidated bank level, um, cooperation is effective, okay? But not if you look at the very, very large banks. And these are the banks that also have subsidiaries in many countries, so they can, they can shift risks pretty, um, pretty easily. So the idea is that, um, you know, cooperation between A and B kind of makes it difficult to, for banks you know, to take risk in this country, and this creates this pressure to, to, to shift risk into, um, in, into third countries. And there, there's quite some, some literature, mostly theoretical, uh, on this, and people in the audience have, have contributed on this. So, for example, there's this idea of negative externalities across, across countries. So, so, you know, if a bank from A is failing, it has negative spillovers on, on B. So once A and B cooperate, you know, these negative ex externalities are internalized, and this makes um, more stringent supervision um, uh, optimal. There are also arguments based on, on heterogeneity, right? So if you have countries that, that differ initially in, in, in the stringency of, of regulation, so, so theory suggests that there will be the tendency to, to only cooperate if, if basically you move to, to, a stricter, um, uh, to a stricter standard. But there's also a sense in which um, 
you know, uh, supervision is becoming more effective, and it's simply because you have more information, right? So you can exchange information about cross-border movements, and this makes it easier for you to detect, um, detect risk. So all, all of these channels basically suggest that, you know, uh, it, it's going to be harder for, for banks to take risk in. Uh... So basically in this paper, we, 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 we showed two, uh, two things. So one is, you know, this incomplete uh, coverage creates uh, a third country uh, risk shifting. And second, um, this, this risk shifting in turn has kind of effects for the distribution of gains and costs of, um, of cooperation. So basically the costs are shifted kind of outside the, uh, the, the cooperation uh, area where the gains are mostly in, within the countries that, that are cooperating. So we have collected a, a large set of, of, of data, so hand-collected uh, data. It's on formal cooperation um, um, agreements. So we have quite a large number of countries. So in terms of home countries, we have about 100. In terms of subsidiary countries, uh, we, have, we, have, we, have, we have more. Um, what's also interesting is that these uh, agreements, they're bilateral or multilateral. So actually, we have quite a, a big number of kind of pairs or, or sets of, of countries, so we have more than 10,000 kind of potential country pairs that, that, that can cooperate. Um, so we have now data since 1995. So for this uh, a second paper, we, we updated the data to, uh, to 2019. Now we look at simply here the existence of, of cooperation uh, agreements. Um, so if you look at the data, so now in this, this map, um, kind of dark is, is, is good. And in the previous paper, dark was, uh, was bad. So, so here dark is having higher uh, cooperation intensities. So what you see is that there's a lot of variation um, uh, across countries. So basically here we measure basically for each country with how many other countries in our data set you're, you're, you're cooperating. Well, you see it's in Europe, it's, it's, it's relatively dark, reflecting, for example, the, the banking union. But you see that there are cooperation agreements in many other places um, of the world. So there's a lot of cooperation in, in Africa and, um, and Latin America. Now you can say that, um, you know, cooperation, I mean, this should be conditioned on, on kind of having some banking links, right? So there's no sense of cooperating if you don't have any um, uh, banks in common. So what we're doing is we, we're combining this with um, a kind of a banking sample. So we have a large set of, of, of banks. Uh, so they have 600 subsidiaries. Um, they spend 47 uh, home countries and, and 100 uh, host countries. And now we can compare, uh, we can calculate a, a different metric. So here, um, so DAGA is again um, higher coverage uh, in, in, in this case. So, so basically what we are doing is we are calculating metrics at the country level. So we're looking for a country at all the, uh, the banks incorporated, uh, like headquartered in, in that, that country. And then we, we, we look uh, to what extent the, the parent subsidiary, the home host uh, relationships uh, are covered by, by, by cooperation um, agreements. And you see that, you know, we get a bit different um, um, uh, pictures. So for example, um, Europe kind of gets a bit lighter. And, and, and the reason is that, yes, we have the banking union, but we also have kind of uh, relationships, you know, uh, European banks in, in, in Latin America and, uh, and other places in, in the world. So this kind of reduces the the, um, the, 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 the coverage. And another interesting example is, um, is Latin America. So actually they, they don't, um, you know, really look, look at this part of Latin America. So they actually they don't cooperate much, but they cooperate exactly where, the, so they have all, a few banks that are really locally overlapping and they're cooperating exactly, you know, in, in, the, in these areas. And that's why they're very dark, okay? So they, they have low intensities, but they have high, um, have high coverage. Okay, so this is from our uh, kind of first paper. So basically, it's kind of the direct effect, right? So, so looking here at, at, at lending um, in, in a subsidiary, so we, let's say we think about lending as a measure of, uh, of risk taking. And here, basically, the, the home and host countries start uh, cooperating, and we see that lending slows. Okay, so that's kind of, kind of motivating the, this idea of, of, of making it more difficult to, uh, to take a risk in, uh, in A and B. Now here we are looking at the, the third country effect, right? Uh, so, so let's look at um, Royal Bank of Scotland in, in uh, 2008 and 2009. And let's look at uh, risk shifting in, into the uh, Argentinian um, uh, subsidiary. Um, so, so arguably in, in 2008, there was not much risk shifting pressure because there were uh, eight other subsidiaries and only one, so Doug is indicating a cooperation agreement with, with the UK. So only one is, is covered by a, a cooperation agreement. Now in 2009, um, so basically UK signs 
cooperation agreements uh, with, with many other countries. So basically, then how many uh, subsidiaries are, are covered by, by cooperation agreements. So you can argue that in 2009, the, the pressure to shift risk into to Argentine has, uh, has increased. Okay? That's basically what, what, what we're going to study um, regression. So the setup is, um, so basically we are we're interested in how a risk allocation into a specific subsidiary, um, how it, this depends on cooperation coverage in, in, in the rest of the, the, the group. So we are regressing um, lending as a measure of, of risk taking on a, a group cooperation. What is group cooperation? It's the share of subsidiary countries of the banking group that have a cooperation agreement with the home country excluding the subsidiary itself. Okay, it's like the, 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 the cooperation coverage in, in, in the rest of the... the, 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 the. And for, for identification, what, what is interesting is here that we are, we are basically relying on, on third country. Okay, so when, when third countries um, sign cooperation agreements with the UK, we look at how this is influencing um, uh, Argentina. In particular, what, what we can do is we can, um, in, in, in our setting, we can completely control for, um, you know, parent subsidiary country uh, time fixed effects, right? So we can, we can have a, a better, a time fixed effect. So basically, we are, we are, we are comparing uh, two subsidiaries uh, in the same country. So they have the, 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 the parent bank is also in identical countries, but th these banking groups, they have different geographic footprints. And our third countries are signing agreements with the UK that this creates differential risk shifting. Um, uh, okay, so we find that um, lending indeed um, shifts out. So it shifts into the, 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 the subsidiary if uh, group cooperation um, increases. Now, um, this seems to be also indicating a, a general a change in risk. So it's it's also that it's, it's not just substitution away from from um, from other activities. It's really an increase in in the size of the the subsidiary. Um, leverage increases, so the liability side becomes more um, becomes more uh, risky. And if you look at the the Z score as an overall measure of default risk, it also indicates higher higher riskiness. So we do an, an alternative exercise at the, the loan level. So the first exercise is, is really looking at, at the overall subsidiary. And now we look at, at individual loans. And basically what we do is we look um, for a given loan. So we take a loan as given uh, through which subsidiary a banking group is originating the loan. Okay, And we look at how this is relating to residual group cooperation of this, um, of this uh, subsidiary. And basically we find the same kind of uh, type of results. So basically there's this this risk shifting um, uh, pressure. And here at the loan level, what we can also look at, we can look at explicit measures of lending risk or loan risk. We find that if yeah, the, the loan is ex under risk here, you know, this risk shifting pressure is, um, is, um, is, is more pronounced. So then we look at several um, kind of determinants of this risk shifting. So we look at what kind of uh, country characteristics for the, from the subsidiary perspective affect the, the, the extent of, um, of risk shifting. And, and one thing we look at is um, supervisory stringency. Okay, so the idea is, that, okay, if, if it's motivated by, by risk shifting, then if supervisory stringency in a subsidiary country is, is high, then this should uh, mitigate the, um, the risk shifting. And, and that's also what we find. So we have different measures of a relative stringency, so subsidiary country versus uh, subsidiaries in the rest of the banking group. Okay, so we, we, we construct um, relative stringency measures, and so we have different proxies for, for, for those, and in each case, they, they indicate that, you know, if, if the subsidiary country, you know, basically they can protect themselves against the, the inflows by, by having, a, you know, a stringent uh, supervisory framework. So in the last part, um, we are looking at basically the distribution of benefits and costs from, um, from, from, from cooperation. And basically, if you think about this uh, through, so basically there's, there's an interesting implication here, right? So, so, so if you look at the effectiveness of uh, cooperation purely from the perspective of country A and B, actually it's increasing if banking groups can shift risk into C. So we also have a model um, uh, 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 underpinning this, but basically the, the, the idea is that, yeah, so if, if basically there's no risk shifting uh, opportunity into country uh, C for, for banking groups, so if they face more stringent 
uh, supervision in, in A and B, yes, they will reduce risk a bit, but you know they want to still keep up their risk. So they're doing some risk shifting within the, the, the countries. But if there's opportunity to shift into C, you know, they, they will shift risk um, at least partially into C, and this, this lowers risk in, in. So if kind of we just look naively at A and B, it looks like um, you know, supervision has become more effective in, in, in terms of um, reducing risk in, in these countries. Of course, the risk on the world level is, is just um, shifted around. So the prediction uh, based on, on, on our model is that so if A and B do not internalize this effect, so then they don't kind of uh, consider also this negative effect on, 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 on country C, then actually their, their gains from cooperation, you know, they're higher if, if they're, they're, there's risk shifting opportunities. Uh, for for their for their banks, so the prediction is basically yeah. So if risk shifting opportunities for banks um, exist, um, that they can shift risk into third countries. So the the gains from from cooperation they are they are, they are higher for for A and B. And basically, what we do is so we look at um, existing kind of frameworks, existing models of the the benefits and costs to uh, to cooperation. And we, we kind of amend them by including this, this new risk shifting, um, a new risk shifting term. So specifically what we're doing is we, we are, we are, we are, we are now explaining cooperation. So we are uh, regressing the propensity of two countries to, um, uh, to cooperate on kind of controls, general controls for cooperation costs and benefit, and then this new risk shifting um, uh, term. And, and how do we measure this? So we have kind of several ways um, uh, to do this in the pair, but the, the most intuitive one is, so you look at kind of the number of third countries uh, in which banking groups that are active in B uh, and, and A and B um, uh, operate, right? So that this kind of measures the, the opportunity in, in terms of the, the countries that um, they exploit for, for, shifting, um, for shifting risk. And um, what we find is that, yeah, so this risk shifting um, a measure Okay, this risk shifting opportunity measure is, is positively related to um, uh, to, uh, to cooperation across across countries, and so so basically, what does it mean? Yeah, so when uh, supervision appears to be more effective uh, from, from the perspective of um, country A and B, because it, a risk can be shifted into into C, A and B are also more likely to um, uh, to cooperate, right? And and this kind of um, yeah, this indicates like a negative uh, a kind of a cost. Um, so this is a potential source of, of inefficiency, right? Because these are kind of gains accruing to A and B, but actually they come at the cost of, um, of C. So here we have a graph, um, a map, where basically we look at this, this risk shifting um, uh, potential. So this is now from the, the subsidiary country, a perspective of, of a subsidiary country. And basically we look at um, for a country, we, we take all the subsidiaries from, from a, a global banking groups, and then we look at um, how these groups uh, are cooperating, again, in their residual um, a, a subsidiary structure, right? So this measures basically the potential of or, or, or the, the, the risk-shifting pressure you get from, from outside the, 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 the country. And now the map, again, it changes. So the darker is um, indicating... Um, Higher, higher risk shifting um, exposure. And now it looks like a bit like kind of developed, developing country uh, a divide. So like, uh, let's say Europe and North America, they do quite well, also because they're mostly, um, you know, they, they, they have the parent group in, 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 their, in their countries. But then for example, um, South America, um, you know, uh, kind of, so they, they host a lot of subsidiaries of, um, of uh, for example, European uh, a banking groups, so they're exposed to this, um, this risk shifting pressure. Okay, so let me um, wrap up and, and come to conclude. So basically, the, the, the main thing we want to point out here is that there's this mismatch of cooperation area and, and footprint, geographic footprint of, of banks. So this is what we call incomplete uh, coverage. And this creates risk shifting into, um, into third countries. And this undermines, on one hand, the, the, uh, it, it undermines the global effectiveness of, of, um, of cooperation agreements, but it also potentially creates this incentive problem, right? So if the set of countries that are thinking about cooperation differs from the affected uh, countries, then basically, you know, the, um, the, the, the incentives might be distorted because the, the cost of cooperation, they're partly shifted 
to, uh, to, to the countries um, outside. Now, the policy implementation is, is very clear, so it's really about this mismatch, right? So, so what it means is that, yeah, so when you think about cooperating, I mean, you should think kind of big in terms of the, the country, so you should uh, involve all countries, um, or as much as possible, the countries where the banks have a, a, a meaningful um, a footprint. And uh, what we also argue that this also speaks in favor of multilateral uh, agreements, where basically on, on one shot, you know, you're, you're trying to, to set up a, a big a a agreement among many countries um, at the same time. So this kind of reduces the, the negative uh, potential side effects of, of cooperation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Wolf. Um, perfect timing. Our discussion is um, David Marcus from ECB's research department. Please, David. In a nutshell, what this paper is doing is the, to show that an increase in cooperation, and cooperation is a proxy for supervisory scrutiny. Uh, banks expand, and where would a bank expand? So they would go to greener pastures. So what do we call greener pastures? It's places in which there would be less scrutiny because scrutiny is uh, expensive for banks. And the mechanism, as uh, Wolf explained better than me, is that countries do not internalize effects in third countries. So that's, uh, in turn, uh, this will lead to an increase in the propensity to coordinate, right? So very graphically, uh, we've got a cat, which is the, the supervisor chasing the bank uh, because he doesn't want the bank to take excessive risks on other people's money. And uh, what the mouse does is to hide and obviously the cat will find another cat to cooperate with and to reduce the, the cost for the supervisor. So this is in a nutshell what this paper is doing. Now, <clears throat> my first job at the ECB uh, around 20 years ago when I was in policy is to attend the Banking Supervisory Committee in which all the EU uh, countries uh, coordinate and have informal coordination agreements. So, uh, I'm very sympathetic to this type of work and also very skeptical to some extent on, the, on, the, on, 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 on how this could be um, nailed down with the current setting. So is the question large enough? I think so. I think the power of supervision is, is, is being hardly studied in the literature. I think it's super important. Can they answer it? Uh, I think the authors do a great job and think it's a very important paper. But to my mind, uh, you are trying to answer too many questions. And again, I love this paper because you are actually looking at a major uh, question. And normally, as you know, there tends to be like a trade-off. I will talk about it, uh, but I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic about this type of work and I think it's very, very important. Now, why am I convinced about the power of supervision? So let me give you an example very close to home. Uh, as you know, in 2012, uh, the SSM was actually unexpectedly announced uh, and there were talks for, for, for the need of a banking union in Europe and a size threshold for banks to be inside the SSM was announced. It was 30 million, 30 billion, sorry. So banks have a whole year until the ECB assume the supervision of the largest banks. So I think this is gonna be helpful to bring uh, the point of the authors home in the following sense. If you look at the distribution of banks' assets in the year prior to the announcement, which is, this is basically the distribution of banks according to size. And as you can see, in 2000, it's a kernel distribution, so you see how the tails are going down at the end. This is purely by construction. But effectively, in 2012, the red line, uh, banks were very smoothly distributed around the threshold of 30 billion. In the year after, you see that many banks shifted because of anticipation of a stronger supervisors. So I think I'm very sympathetic to this in Europe, at least, uh, to the issue of the supervision and even on expectations of supervision. This is an anticipation effect, which I think is also interesting. So on the data, uh, in most papers, uh, there is a big trade-off between a big question uh, in terms of scope and the identification of a very little component, which is very well specified. This paper tries to do both. Uh, it focuses on the identification, but to my mind, 
still very little on the data in the ten, for instance, uh, uh, before 2014, the data has been hand collected from annual reports, regulatory website, and newspaper articles. This is the core of the paper. I would like to know more about this. Maybe it's my background, but I, want, I wanted to understand where this data coming from and what happening in Honduras. Are they coordinating more with, uh, with, uh, with, with the countries around that, that, that? I would like to know more about that. Now, I fully understand that in, 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 in a central bank, we have the luxury of data, but I have a very big quirk with the use of syndicated loan data, uh, because in the end, this is just one way of expanding direct lending. Uh, they also do cross-section, uh, cross-selling of all the products, and they occur very, very rarely. In theory, to nail supply effects, which is what we are talking about, you will need to have two different syndicates before and after. And in Europe, this happens very, very rarely. It's around two firms a year that happen syndicated loans happening from two different syndicates before and after. My last point is about cooperation. Uh, the authors pull together all types of cooperation, from NUMOU, which uh, for the people in the jargon is Memorandum of Understanding, to an actual supranational supervisor, right? So you are bringing together legally, legally binding agreements with an informal paper which has been signed at one point in time. Now, people in the business who have been done, doing policy for a long time, they know that cooperation is very often a proxy for the lack of action. And you having lived in the, in, in the Netherlands, and Thorsten having lived in the Netherlands, we know what happened with MB and AMRO. I can tell you there were a lot of cooperation agreements down there. There are also implementation problems, time consistency. It's very easy to sign a paper, a piece of paper with another supervisor now in a different country. It's a very different thing to put fiscal money when the financial authorities need to, need to intervene. So how about uh, also considering for failing banks which cooperation agreement had prior to failing? I'm convinced that the majority of banks who failed had a cooperation agreement in place. Econometrically, you could use local projection, act, adding different types of cooperation agreements as a predictor of failing bank. And then, of course, the other issue is how about the incentives to cooperate not to implement a stricter supervision? I remember the light touch regulation from Gordon Brown in the UK before the crisis. Often, coordination is an excuse not to increase the supervision of, 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 of banks. So, I said cooperation sometimes in this country, this is the blue light, uh, Wolf, you are familiar with. It's, it's, uh, it's something we are worried about, and, and, and I would like to see more about that. So to summarize and to let you go, all of you, uh, and to after thanking Andreas again for a great supervision, a great, supervision, a great conference. Um, you see, this is a Freudian sleep for a great supervision. We, we used to work together. I would like to know more about the data. I would like to know more about the type of cooperation. Uh, this is a relevant question, very well executed by uh, excellent uh, co-authors, and I think it's an important paper with great potential that I would, I would love to see very well published because I think it's, it's a very important contribution. Thank you so very much. And, and I don't want you to go now um, because we still have a speech. So thanks, Dav. <laughs> thanks, thanks, David, for your kind words, and thanks for... Uh, for your discussion. So then we go to the uh, last uh, question and answer uh, around this afternoon, and the demand is high. Um, Harry, Giovanni, yeah. um, Diana. So, so I wonder whether, to what extent these cooperation agreements, that is whether a country enters into a f agreements with other countries, whether that could reflect, uh, say, local uh, supervisory employment, because in the end you need people to carry out and do this cooperation, right? And then local uh, employment of supervisors, it could, it could also affect uh, bank risk taking and therefore the quality of supervision. So I wonder whether there's an employment issue here. Hi, uh, Giovanni Bassan here from the SSM. Um, um, it, it, it's quite interesting. I was uh, probably the question actually should be to you on your previous paper, because I think you mentioned that you found out that even if there is this consolidated supervision, 
at the end of the day, that doesn't catch actually the risk in those third countries. And for somebody doing supervision, this is something a bit surprising in a sense, because we are, we are, we are supposed to think that through consolidating supervision, we should be actually able to supervise risks uh, in all the perimeter of consolidation. If that doesn't happen because you don't have enough information coming from a country, uh, you should actually ask the bank to deconsolidate the subsidiary, which then the prudential treatment is gonna be much more. So it seems to me that, uh, maybe it's true, eh? I mean, I'm not saying that it's not true, but the, uh, the, 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 the findings, and again, maybe more from your previous paper, are against the way consolidated supervision works so in a sense. So this is supposed to work, which will be something significantly depressing in a sense. And also I wasn't sure how you actually define this, uh, what third countries are, because I think you have a very extensive definition of what third countries are. I, I guess all Eastern Europe from, from, the, from the charts you show will become a third country as opposed to the, um, SSM and also all South America is basically a third country. So we basically supervise banks on a consolidated basis. And if there are countries where we can actually get into, we should actually take them out for, for what consolidated supervision is. So we have a country right now, you can imagine which one, which presents a lot of problems, but this is sort of an exception. You seem to actually generalize this aspect uh, very much. Yeah, so for you, I mean, it's it's amazing that it work. Uh, and you mentioned that, I mean, there's a lot of variation on, on cooperation intensity. Uh, and I think David also appealed to this. I, I would be very interested to, 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 to learn if you can somehow explore this further, for instance. Um, I mean, I wonder if there's agreements that are focused on specific banking groups like Santander compared to very general high level agreements. Also, how does this link to the the, the, the actual cross-border banking structure? I mean, for instance, if, uh, if 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 these are agreements between countries that are mostly hosts of uh, of foreign banks, I don't know. I, I I think there's tons of interesting questions to to be asked there. I appreciate you're trying to finish up, so I'll be brief. Mary Elizabeth McMahon, I'm from the Central Bank of Ireland. Thank you very much for the paper. Um, I couldn't, um, I had to stop myself going um, to the question of effectiveness. And I don't know whether through your research um, you kind of tested for the uh, cooperation effectiveness in crisis times um, and, and uh, you know, whether the existence ultimately of the cooperation agreement, I, I think you touched on this, David, um, really um, did it show anything. And then secondly, for me, um, given that you had, you said you had, I think, 93 countries, you've over 10,000 of the kind of relationships, whether we know that these group structures change and morph, uh, you know, continuously um, through your, your data gathering, uh, do the cooperation agreements change or do they remain static? Just a few comments. It's it's really a very interesting paper covering an understudied topic. It's also brave to present this paper to a room full of supervisors. Uh, let me tell you, uh, there would be no change in legal form of cooperation between uh, SSM supervisors between 2012, 13, 14, and now. But the scope, the effectiveness, the standardization is two different words. So also sometimes <laughs> within even a single group of supervisor following a single legal framework, 10 years would make a, a huge difference if it's a project like creation of SSM. Uh, and this is just one of the aspects where we would need to look into much more detail uh, in terms of what cooperation <laughs> really means to to have a, a, a meaningful uh, benchmark. Uh, uh, in any case, uh, I, what I would also, jo uh, joining uh, Giovanni here, look into, and perhaps you could comment this, uh, how those countries that are those third countries treated a bit as a, let's say, a lower uh, standards 
uh, jurisdictions, how they react to this status and whether they aware, being aware of this status, whether they uh, don't increase actually uh, their benchmarks. I think we would have real life examples of such countries. Uh, maybe Eastern Europe is one of, of those uh, where, where, where some jurisdictions are perfectly aware that the sub subsidiaries located there might be treated in the way you describe. And then ring fencing is <laughs> a natural reaction. So maybe a comment on this would be, would be welcome. Many thanks. Okay, please. Well, yeah, a lot, lot of uh, questions. Uh, th 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 thanks a lot. So maybe working in reverse um, order. So I, I would be interested in your your, your real life example. So we, we talked to Latin American uh, supervisors, and and they are aware of each other, right? So so they know. Okay, something happens in this country. It's shifted into my country. I, I react. So there's there's this notion of of interdependence. It's um, it's clearly there. And I think there were two questions on, um, I mean, related on kind of evolving cooperation. So basically our data set is dynamic, right? So, so we're updating every year, right? So, so it's a kind of, a, it's, it's a pattern. But basically, the, you know, the, the banking union would be a one, right? So, so because if you just look here at the existence, so, so basically once you're in, you jump from zero to, uh, to one. So, so, so that's, so we wouldn't kind of, if cooperation agreements evolve, Right, and they, they become better, so we wouldn't capture this um, in, in this in this sense. Um, yes, there were some comments on the type of agreements. So we have some limited information. I, I think we can we can do more work um, on this. So the previous paper we we, we split it up, and we 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 found they're each individually uh, significant, but we couldn't find significant differences in in their effectiveness. Okay, so that's but yeah. So maybe we should we should. Uh, um, so basically, Giovanni, on the consolidated um, supervision, I, I think it's probably just a, a language problem. So I, I didn't talk about consolidated supervision. I meant uh, the consolidated banks so in terms of accounting, right? So, so not looking at individual subsidiaries. So I'm just looking at the total group, the risk of, of the group, and I consolidate parent and subsidiaries. Okay, this, this was the statement. And, and there we, we found it, it, it is effective, um, so it, 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 does, it does, does work, except so the overall sample, except when we split up and we look at the, the real big um, uh, cross, cross border banks. Um, so Harry had a question on, on kind of basic endogeneity of, of, of cooperation, right? So kind of employment, um, you know, so it needs manpower to, um, to, um, to, um, to, uh, to kind of implement this, this cooperation, so, so I agree. So, so this, um, so one of the concerns is that yeah, cooperation is endogenous, and that's why we, we focus in this paper on, on third country effects, right? So it's driven by third countries. So it's not driven by Argentina, it's by, by, by third countries signing agreements with um, with the UK. So basically, then these endogeneity concerns, I think they're less. Kind of, you can still find some concerns, but I think they're less first um, first order. Um, yeah, David. Thanks so much for the for the for the, for the comments. I think it was a very nice um, um, kind of set of, of of comments that we we can we can take on board. So data collection, because the second paper we were kind of a bit brief, and in this paper I think it's good to know that people want want to to see more because that's it was like a multi year effort to collect um, this um, this data. But basically, so we have like a sequence of sources, and we start from the. The, the relevant authorities, the national authorities, and we look for information there. And, and it's all imperfect, but what helps us that we have several countries, right? So if it's bilateral, I mean, it's at least a bilateral agreement, so if one country has kind of patchy information, we, we can still hope to get it from, from the other country. So in many cases, this helps us that we actually, we can get these agreements from, uh, from, from different sides. Um, yeah, syndicated loans, I, uh, I agree. And you, you mentioned a very important point on cooperation and bank failures, right? So, so that's something we, we also thought about. Um, so it would be really nice. So we, we look kind of at ex ante risk, right? So it's like, a, like the Z score of, um, of, um, of banks. But it would be really nice also to show that this kind of um, also leads to less bank failures. But then we thought, yeah, it, we don't have too many kind of cases um, where, where we observe failures. So we thought about this, and in the end, we're not too confident to run uh, regressions on, um, on on this, so but uh, it, it, it was really on our mind. But the only thing we did is that basically within the 
the context is, again, the first paper, so we said, okay, so this risk effect on, on the Z score, does it go down in a crisis? Or does it, is it, so is, <clears throat> is the effect we estimate in normal times in terms of risk reduction, is it still present in a crisis? And, and, and the answer is yes, okay. But it's still not about failure, it's just about, you know, balance sheet. Um, uh, but um, yeah, th th thanks so much for your, for your, for your comments and, and to everybody else.